He was called a charlatan, a poisoner, a reformer, a knight, a prophet, a miracle worker, a savior, an alchemist, and a fraud. He probably dropped out of university, if he attended at all, and yet he became a doctor at the court of Philip II of Spain and one of history's first medical celebrities, thanks to the miraculous printing press, as he called it. He challenged physicians everywhere, literally, I'll tell you the story of a medical duel in a bit, and he was jailed, accused of poisoning his patients. The Bolognese surgeon Leonardo Fioravanti was very famous in the 16th century and beyond, but he has largely been forgotten by history. Yet his story, from his medical secrets to his flamboyant writing style and his recipe for the Philosopher's Stone, tells us a lot about how medicine was practiced in the Renaissance. And in many ways, his style of healing pointed the way to modern medicine. So join me in uncovering the tale of one of the most famous, or infamous depending on your perspective, characters of the Italian Renaissance that you probably never heard of. And let's, let's untangle the strands and trends of early modern medicine. Hello, lovely history fans. I'm Dr. Julia Martins, and I'm a historian of gender and medicine. I study how the body was understood in the past and how that shapes the present. I have also been not so secretly in love with Fioravanti, or at least with his writing, for more than a decade. So if you would like to support my channel and my unhealthy obsession with 16th century charlatans, to be honest, um, please consider subscribing. And if you enjoy this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, as that really helps the channel. I also have a Patreon, which I will link down below if you are feeling particularly generous. And I apologize in advance for the length of this video, but there's um, everything from alchemy to nose jobs to exorcisms and a mail order business, so I swear I couldn't really make it any shorter. <laughs> helpful to historians when people decide to write their autobiography and tell us all kinds of details about their lives. Yet, in Fioravanti's case, we have to take everything he wrote with a grain of salt. He was known, even in the 16th century, to exaggerate his tales. But he wasn't the only one to think highly of his talents. The Venetian poet Dionigi Atanagi called him an angel of paradise, sent by God to earth for the health and preservation of human life, after Atanagi had been miraculously healed of a gunshot wound by the surgeon. Fioravanti had plenty of admirers. To many of his patients, he was a savior, a prophet, who ushered in a new age in medicine. But he was also abrasive. He made enemies everywhere he went, especially among the physicians. To his competitors in an overcrowded medical marketplace, where physicians, surgeons, and empirics competed for patients, he was ridiculous at best and dangerous at worst, a quack, a fraud. In any case, Fioravanti knew how to grab his readers' interests. In his autobiographical book, Il Tesoro della Vita Umana, The Treasury of Human Life, Fioravanti skips the first decades of his life completely. The story really begins when, at 30 years old, he embarks on a journey for knowledge, in which he would seek medical secrets and learn by experience as an empirical healer. So he wrote, Many years have passed since I left my sweet home, Bologna, solely to travel around the world to gain knowledge of natural philosophy, so that I may practice medicine and surgery better than I could when I began my work. I always looked for precious experiments, whether from learned physicians or simple empirics, from all kinds of people, peasants, shepherds, soldiers, clerics, simple women, ha! and people of all sorts. Already you get a sense of how clever he was with his marketing. And yes, I know that's an anachronistic term, but still, he's writing for a general audience, not for specialists, and he wants you, the reader, to know that he respects you, that he has learned from all kinds of people, all kinds of sources, even simple women, believe it or not. So, in 1548, at 30 years old, Fioravanti leaves Bologna, where he probably attended some classes at the university before dropping out and very likely becoming an apprentice to a surgeon. He goes to Sicily, which had a long medical tradition, in search of the secrets of nature. Specifically, Fioravanti is searching for an idealized, natural or primitive medicine, in his words, which he believes has survived in the countryside among peasants, shepherds and wise women, the first physicians who knew no medical system, nor any method at all, but had good judgment. Now, at the time, disease was everywhere. 
It was inescapable, but it was also arbitrary. Epidemics such as the many kinds of plague periodically appeared and coexisted with everyday ailments, such as wounds caused by accidents or skin rashes. Some diseases, such as leprosy, were believed to be a divine punishment. Syphilis and typhus could also be attributed to sinful behavior. So, medical knowledge coexisted with this theological framework of disease, not to mention other factors, uh, such as corrupt air or astrology. And as they spread, these aggressive diseases weren't responding to the treatments offered by university-trained physicians and their remedies based on balancing the humors. For someone like Fioravanti, it was time to go back to the true medicine that had been developed by the first physicians, largely by observing the healing ways of animals in nature. This medicine had been lost, according to Fioravanti. It had been corrupted by the humoral theory, the great lie of physicians. Fioravanti saw the medicine taught at universities as focusing on the causes of illness. Physicians valued theory over practice. They focused on why the body was healthy or not. And they usually relied on ancient authorities, such as Galen, and the humoral theory. By balancing the humors, the body could be restored to health. Besides that, physicians relied on regulating the non-naturals, such as diet, sleep, and exercise, largely through regimens. And by the way, if you would like a video on the humoral theory in more detail, or the non-naturals, um, or both even, do let me know in the comments. People like Fioravanti, however, were not as interested in the causes behind illness as they were on the ways they could treat patients. As long as the remedy worked, it was good. So he starts learning about distillation and the old ways, rethinking medicine by mixing knowledge from different traditions. In Messina, for instance, Fioravanti learned three remedies to treat wounds from a local surgeon, which would later make him famous. And in his writings, there are plenty of cases when physicians are baffled by a case, and then an old woman will come along and, with the rules of life and an enema, will make the fever cease, and with an ointment will make the pain go away, and with a fomentation will make the patient sleep. And in that case, the old woman will know more than the physician. So, Fioravanti starts practicing in Sicily, and his cures earn him the nickname New Asclepius after the Greek god of medicine. Most importantly, he develops the conviction that the natural ways of healing, this medical primitivism that he found in southern Italy, was superior to what university physicians prescribed, especially in their regimens. And this is something that he believes for the rest of his life. The reason for that is that medical knowledge should be gained by observation and experience. He later wrote, I have not followed Hippocrates, nor Galen, nor Avicenna, nor even any other ancient or modern authors, but only my own reason and experience, often said to be the mother of all things. I have not used the doctrine of others. Therefore, I can truly say, without being pretentious or arrogant, that I am the first author of this new medicine. Fioravanti didn't stay in Sicily for long. He traveled to Naples, and with good reason. He had heard of two surgeons, the brothers Paolo and Pietri Vianeo, who knew a new method of repairing mutilated noses, a kind of proto-rhinoplasty, as it were. This was a useful skill back then, especially during times of war, but also because with the spread of syphilis and syphilitic noses, there would definitely be a market for a surgeon who mastered this kind of operation. So this was one of the secrets to learn on his trip. But there were more. In Naples, there was a thriving culture of experimentation and lots of alchemists. So for context, Although magic in different forms has existed for millennia, it was truly reborn in the Renaissance, in no small measure because of the translation of alchemical texts from Arabic and Greek into Latin. Renaissance magic and alchemy definitely deserve their own video, so let me know in the comments um, if you think that would be interesting. And I'm only going to focus here on the connection between alchemical experimentation and medicine. So, in 1466, Marsilio Ficino, a Neoplatonist scholar who had also studied medicine, came across a manuscript in Greek attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, or three times great Hermes. Stick with me, I promise this is a short tangent. Anyway, these Hermetic books, Hermetic coming from Hermes, claim to contain ancient Egyptian magic. Ficino translated the manuscript, and Hermeticism truly flourished in this period. The main reason for that is 
probably that the promise that by manipulating nature through alchemy, by understanding the secrets of nature, magic could produce wonders, including remedies and elixirs to treat disease and to prolong health. And that's where Fioravanti enters the story. His fascination with taking medicine out of the hands of university-trained physicians, who he believed knew theory but lacked practical knowledge, was heavily influenced by the idea that, through experimentation, nature could reveal her secrets, from how to turn base metals into gold, the great pursuit of alchemists, to how to cure illness. And Naples was the place to be. Much of what later came to be known as the scientific revolution had its origins in natural magic and alchemy, with its focus on experimentation, observation, and trial and error. There were many academies in Naples, including academies of secrets, where people would go and perfect recipes, and these included cosmetic and medicinal recipes too. This kind of haphazard renaissance experimentation guided basically by curiosity, is not the kind that people usually think of when they think of the scientific revolution. But without experimenters like Fioravanti, our idea of 16th century science and medicine would be incomplete. And they did epitomize what is arguably the most novel aspect of science at the time, the focus on practical experience over book learning. In Naples, Fioravanti was immersed in the world of alchemy and its methods, especially distillation. Alchemical medicine was growing in popularity, and so Fioravanti realized how fashionable alchemical remedies, such as distillates, could make him successful. For instance, let's consider the Philosopher's Stone. There were many well-known alchemists during the Renaissance following this um, tradition of Ramon Lull and Arnaldo de Villanova. Lull's writings about an elixir opposing purity and corruption were influential because they gave people like Fioravanti an alchemical framework to understand health and illness. Fioravanti started to think that disease was the result of corrupt matter inside the body, especially in the stomach, which had to be expelled so that the body could be restored to pristine health. One of the alchemists' main pursuits was the Philosopher's Stone, which was believed to be capable of transmuting base metals into gold, but it could also allegedly cure all illnesses, acting, acting sort of like a panacea and prolonging life. And this wasn't a quest just for the literati anymore, but for all kinds of experimenters. Because Fioravanti didn't believe in the humoral theory, and the idea that remedies had to be adapted to each person's individual constitution, a universal remedy seemed possible. So if you look in Fioravanti's books, he does have a recipe for the Philosopher's Stone. It's not that he claimed to be able to turn lead into gold or anything, but that his elixir could transform the body, bringing it back to health. Influenced by the idea of corruption and purgation, his Philosopher's Stone, which could be used by itself or as an ingredient in other recipes to make a herbal mixture sort of more powerful, provoked vomiting using Roman vitriol and mercury. So in a genius move, really, he used the Philosopher's Stone, Pietra Philosophale, as a trade name for a remedy, so that people would want to buy it. Or, if not, they could buy his books, and if they knew anything about distillation, which many people did at the time, they could make their own Philosopher's Stone at home. This new, reformed medicine was based on remedies that were much more aggressive than those usually prescribed by physicians, which he found too delicate. The indispositions in the stomach needed to be violently purged, according to Fioravanti, through diarrhea and or vomiting. Expelling this bodily corruption would require alchemical remedies. And this is why I get so frustrated when people like Fioravanti are left out of conversations about alchemical medicine. Yes, of course, we need to talk about Paracelsus. By the way, I have a video on him coming out soon, so if you're interested in alchemy and medicine, make sure to subscribe to the channel uh, so you can be notified when the video is available. But anyway, uh, Paracelsus was highly influential in changing medicine, especially in Northern Europe. But Fioravanti's southern style of alchemy, if we can call it that, based on an earlier tradition of distilling quintessences to create pure medicines, were, was a big part of the story too. Um, but I digress. So in this period, Fioravanti managed to become a doctor to the son of the Spanish Viceroy and to serve as a military surgeon in the African wars against the Turkish corsairs in the Mediterranean. His knowledge of how to treat wounds came in very handy, for sure. But as always, wars also allow surgeons ample room to practice and to learn. Always 
on the move, we soon find Fioravanti in Rome. He already had a somewhat controversial reputation by then, mainly because everywhere he went, he clashed against the medical establishment. His conflicts with doctors about how to practice medicine were not the only problem, though. So by then, he had started selling secrets. So he was selling medical recipes. People could buy these recipes from him and take them to an apothecary to prepare or make the remedy themselves at home. These included elixirs, such as the Philosopher's Stone, his gunshot wound formulas, or even a miraculous oil to treat wound-related problems. In Rome, Fioravanti tells us in his writings, he was a miraculous healer, who was successful in treating what the physicians believed to be lost causes. But there's more to the story. Fioravanti hadn't applied for a license to practice as a surgeon, as he should have, and he was still building his reputation there. But then, the Venetian ambassador's groom, if I remember correctly, was injured in a fight and no surgeon had been able to treat him, until Fioravanti, who had just come back from treating wounds in the war and was able to successfully treat the man. This is how he described the aftermath. It was on that day that the envy of me began and it never left for the entire time I was in Rome. Still, because of the excellent outcome of this experience, I became very well known in Rome and many others began to seek me. Fioravanti wanted publicity, and he got it. And his story tells us a lot about the early modern medical marketplace. So, just like today, lots of medical practitioners were competing for patients' attention and money. Physicians were up against surgeons, barber surgeons, midwives, hub women, itinerant healers and empirics, plus charlatans. Many of these categories overlapped, but also some of these terms were broadly defined. So, for instance, when we think of a charlatan today, we think of someone who is a fraud, who misleads others, which is how historians of medicine described them for a very long time. But that wasn't how someone in 16th century Rome would have understood the term charlatano. They were often licensed to sell their formulas, and they operated legally. A charlatan was usually someone who mounted a portable stall and sold remedies and cosmetics at the piazza, using catching trade names, for instance, for their products and combining theatrical elements to create stage personas, sometimes singing to promote their medicines and just being very fun and entertaining. Anyway, their products tended to sell really well, maybe because of a mix of the charlatan's charm, but also because there was a growing dissatisfaction with traditional medicine. After several epidemics and the spread of syphilis, both of which physicians hadn't been very successful in treating. So there was a new interest in novelty and elixirs that promised miraculous cures. And of course, to be fair to these charlatans, some of their products did work, such as herbal drinks containing fenugreek for wet nurses or breastfeeding mothers to produce more milk. Still, Although charlatans were ubiquitous in this period, they were often criticized. You can feel this ambivalence in the writing of an English traveler, Fines Morrison. Italy has a generation of empirics who frequently and by swarms go from city to city and haunt their marketplaces. They are called monti banchi, or mounting banks, or little scaffolds, and also charlatani. The wares they sell are commonly distilled waters and diverse ointments for burning aches and stitches and the like. Many of them have some very good secrets, but generally they are all cheaters. I love that quote. Anyway, that says it all. Also, opposing the medical establishment at every turn made Fioravanti a symbol of the Renaissance charlatan. Of course, Fioravanti told readers how all conflicts were caused by the envy of malicious physicians and, that, and the, the jealousy that they felt towards him. And... Although Fioravanti wasn't setting up a stall at the piazza, he had much in common with charlatans, especially his theatricality and the way he marketed his new drugs. As for how his remedies worked, for many conditions, it's possible that his aggressive formulas made people feel better, at least in the short term. By violently purging the body, patients could feel that something was happening, that the corrupt matter was being expelled, and that was proof that there was something inside the body that needed to come out. Fioravanti wasn't the only medical reformer at the time to be using these strategies. Tommaso Bovio of Verona, for instance, also used these expulsive drugs and was also very popular. But there's a, another kind of um, weird comparison uh, that could be made here. These 
Dramatic remedies that had such an extreme effect on the body were particularly popular in the second half of the 16th century, during the Catholic Reformation, when exorcisms were being more frequently performed than before. And exorcisms often involved administering potent drugs to physically expel demons from the body by vomiting and diarrhea. Maybe this theatrical way of reading the body of evil, whether a spiritual or a physical evil, indicates some overlap between religious and medical practices. Hellebore, for instance, was used both by exorcists as an antimalefic agent and by Fioravanti to purge the body. Coming back to charlatans, they also explored this theatrical side in the way they sold their products. In a way, Fioravanti described his healing methods as kind of a physiological exorcism. He didn't just heal patients, he saved them. So to build his persona, he appropriated lots of different identities, from the countryside peasants to charlatans and even exorcists. Still, Fioravanti also felt the pressure to compete against other medical professionals. In the same way he was criticized by physicians, perhaps surprisingly, he denounced anatomists. So for context, medical students in his native Bologna would have watched human dissection at the university from the beginning of the 14th century. But as this practice spread in the 16th century, especially thanks to his contemporary Andreas Vesalius, Fioravanti and many others wrote against it. He called it a pitiless and cruel practice, closer to the butcher's trade than medicine. By the way, let me know in the comments if you would like a video about the rise of dissection and Vesalius, because um, I think that's very interesting. But anyway, Fioravanti wrote that it was a delightful art, good to know how to talk about in the company of others, but he warned against anatomy becoming too central to medicine. His disgust and hostility probably had much to do with the competitive nature of the medical marketplace, though. Surgery had long been taught by apprenticeship, but it had risen from a craft to become a part of the medical curriculum at universities. Maybe this was why he protested the way anatomists, rival to surgeons, were taking over. That's the thing with Fioravanti. He was always savvy in terms of how to sell his products and himself. During his time in Rome, he became a medical businessman, as it were. I'll embrace this anachronism completely and say that he started a mail-order business, because that's what it was, essentially. So patients would write letters to him and he would write back for a fee, including recipes and instructions on how to prepare the remedy. This was a clever strategy and, although consulting doctors by correspondence became commonplace a few centuries later, it was a very novel idea in Fioravanti's day. When he started writing books later on, he used many of the letters he received from patients as a way to bolster his reputation. So he included things like, Now, I do not expect you, the reader, to just believe me, but instead credit the many testimonies that you will find in these letters. And if someone should become ill in a similar way, they can have the courage to cure themselves with our instructions, even if they live in distant places, as many have and continue to do. At the same time, Fioravanti was making sure that his remedies had catchy names. Mighty Elixir, Blessed Oil, Aromatic Goddess, Leonardo's Grand Liquor, and Angelic Electuary. He was popular, for sure, but his disdain for the medical establishment and the sheer violence of his treatments meant that soon he was accused by physicians of killing his patients instead of healing them. Fioravanti attributed that to envy and decided it was time to leave. He was an iconoclast, he wanted to reform medicine, but he also wanted to become famous in the process. And maybe Venice, the capital of print at the time, was the way to go. Through publishing his works, he would make sure his name entered history. Or so he thought. And so, to Venice he went. If you're still with me, Thank you, I appreciate it, and I realize this video is getting long. My tea is depressingly cold, to be honest, um, and Pancake has abandoned me without a second thought, but there's so much to go through. Anyway, so Venice in the 16th century was bubbling with activity. It was a rich and powerful city, and it acted as a crossroads in commerce. There was little you couldn't buy at Piazza San Marco. Perfumes from Arabia, Indian spices, new and exotic plants from the New World, lapis lazuli from Persia, you name it. 
it, many of these products were used in medical and cosmetic recipes. And just to give you an idea, Venice had over 70 apothecary shops and Fioravanti soon became acquainted with over a dozen pharmacists who produced and sold his medicines. Now, keep in mind that Besides anatomical theatres at universities and alchemical workshops in aristocratic households, there were few of what we would today call scientific laboratories until the following century. Much research and experimentation happened in people's homes, often in the kitchen, but also at academies, including Fioravanti's Academy of Secrets in Naples that I mentioned earlier. So craftsmen workshops as well, and you guessed it, pharmacies. And that makes sense. Apothecaries needed to know how to prepare remedies, and that often meant knowing a little bit of alchemy and definitely a lot about distillation. So a Venice pharmacy would be a place where people like Fioravanti would gather, test recipes, and essentially create new knowledge. Doctors saw patients in pharmacies too, but there was another reason why Venice was the natural next step for Fioravanti. It had a thriving print culture. So the printing press is deeply connected to many big changes that happened in this period, from religious reform to humanism and what we would later call the scientific revolution. And Fioravanti was well aware of just how powerful the printing press was, as you can tell by his writings. So he wrote things like, Before the glorious art of printing came into being, there were very few literati. Because of the high cost of books, no one who was not rich could study. The poor were necessarily ignorant against their will, and those who knew Greek and Latin dazzled those who did not. The learned were truly content then, since they were revered as if they were gods. He also wrote, The day may come in which we will all be doctors in a way, in the sense of learned. For today I can see that many of us, even the women, ha, the shock, speak of philosophy, medicine, astrology, mathematics, and the many other sciences that there are without being doctors. No one can be tricked, since anyone who wishes to tire their brain a little can be learned. And the cause for this has been the printing press, which has so benefited the world. Fioravanti was onto something. Like pharmacies, printers' workshops were centers of knowledge production and innovation. In terms of medicine, medical knowledge from different cultures mixed in Venice. Those who shared it through print in an accessible way could become highly successful. Plus, since the 1550s, medical self-help books, if we can call them that, had become bestsellers. They mostly contained recipes to produce remedies, but also lots of other things, from hair dye to invisible ink for secret letters. And the most successful of these books were the ones penned by a certain Don Alessio Piemontese, who was very likely a pseudonym, an, an editorial invention, created by a man called Girolamo Ruscelli. And, very conveniently, Fioravanti was close friends with Rochelle. They had met in Naples through their shared interest in alchemy. And if you're interested in this mysterious character, Piemontese, do let me know, as I think he deserves his own video, fictitious or not. Anyway, in any case, Rochelle was working as a polygrapho, a tradesman of the pen, as it were, kind of like an editor at a printing house. He introduced Fioravanti around, and soon he was working as an editor too, before publishing his own works. He added a short text on surgery on the first book he edited and managed to recommend his own remedies throughout the book and also to mention his forthcoming book. This just goes to show how interconnected the worlds of medicine and print were at the time. There was even a name for the kind of writer that Fioravanti became, which was also exemplified by Alessio Piemontese, a professor of secrets. The first one to categorize them had been a friar, Tommaso Garzoni, in a book describing all the professions of the world. Garzoni described these people as experimenters who collected secrets, recipes, that they desire more than any of life's daily needs. But they did more than just collect, they wrote down and published these secrets or recipes. They professed them for everyone to hear. There was a big debate at the time about the ethics of knowledge, about who should have access to certain kinds of knowledge, such as alchemy and medicine. But again, this video is long enough as it is, so maybe I'll make another one about the question of openness and secrecy at the time, if you find that interesting, so let me know in the comments. But anyway, for people like Fioravanti, the printing press, the possibility of writing in the vernacular instead of in Latin, the growing literacy rates, and the popularity of cheaply printed books allowed him to market his remedies to an even bigger public. And by repackaging country cures to 
urban readers essentially mixing different traditions and incorporating different voices, such as those of herb women and midwives, by appropriating all these identities, the text became eclectic and rich and just fun to read. So arguably, anyone could find something of interest in a book by Fioravanti. Plus, the language was just so accessible. According to him, everyone should have access to medical knowledge. So he wrote, and that is why there should be many kinds of writers, since some write for high and exalted minds, some for the middling sort, and some for those who do not understand very much at all. So if my work is not for intellectuals, nor even for those of middling quality, at least it will be for those who understand little, for they are the hungriest, and I want everyone to have some food for thought. Of course, this excessive modesty is cleverly constructed. He knew and expected that his books would be read by the nobility and learned people in general. As always, marketing was at the center of his style and the way he self-fashioned his persona. Fioravanti's books described remedies people could make themselves, but he also wrote how, if you preferred to, you could buy the medicines directly at the pharmacies he recommended. When you went to a pharmacy, you could often buy his books there, and of course, you could have a consultation with Fioravanti himself, if you so wished. And you could also buy remedies or books from him directly. So everything was cleverly connected. Because it was tricky to make much money as a writer, just like today, <laughs> keep in mind that copyright back then was still very much in its early days, and books were plagiarized all the time, and writers weren't always paid properly, especially when a book was reprinted, it was better and wiser not to rely on book sales exclusively. And with this demand for novelty, there was always a market for new books and new recipes, even though many of them were very similar sort of cure-all elixirs. Still, Fioravanti was obsessed with fame, and he believed he would achieve it through print. Only those who are written up in books live forever, he wrote. And it's true that printing transformed what it meant to be famous in this period, and it did make things easier for future historians. So I want to show something to you that I came across when I was studying in Bologna and falling in love with the story of Fioravanti over a decade ago. You guessed it, it's a 16th century book by him that I found in an old bookshop. So this is one of his books of secrets, and there's everything from alchemy to medicine, surgery, cosmetics, and he's styling himself as doctor and knight. And you can see here how he's presenting himself to the reader as a wise, experienced person, an authority in his field. There are recipes for anything you can possibly imagine, so um, how to treat worms in children. There are also recipes, uh, this one, how to induce menstruation, so to make someone have a period if they're um, not having one, which can be read as an abortion recipe. So anything you could possibly need, Fioravanti has it for you, right here. So, all was going well for Fioravanti in Venice. He had a stable medical practice, he was friends with pharmacists. In fact, his remedies by then were sold in Naples, in Rome, in Milan, and even London. He was writing and publishing non-stop, and the Holy Roman Emperor even invited him to serve as a military surgeon in the campaign against the Turks in Hungary, but he declined the offer. And he also received a letter from Naples saying that he was greatly missed there, and that his supporters were raising funds to get him to return and to become a city physician. Once more, Fioravanti declined it and the considerable salary that he would make. Instead, he sent copies of his books to be sold in Naples, because why not? He must have felt that he was really, truly thriving in Venice. Still, technically, he was once more practicing medicine illegally. He hadn't obtained a license from the Venetian health board, the Provveditori alla Sanità. He was allowed to work as a surgeon, meaning he could treat the body externally, so wounds, broken limbs, etc., but not internally. He couldn't prescribe medicines to be taken orally, like physicians did, for instance, since he didn't have a medical degree. But that wasn't the only problem. Venetian physicians accused him of putting his patients in danger and of being a vagabond. The following year, they accused Fioravanti of outright killing his patients with his violent treatments. Of course, he called this the conspiracy of doctors against him. And so, for the first time in 20 years, he returned to Bologna, which he called his Dolce Patria, or Sweet Home, Sweet Homeland. He applied for doctorates in both medicine and arts, and, believe it or not, he got them. He became a doctor in his 50s. You can still see the document in the Archivio di Stato di Bologna, the state archive. As a graduate, he also got a Palatine knighthood, which 
Even though it was just an honorific title, he was very quick to add to his books. He styled himself as the doctor and knight Leonardo Fioravanti. By then, Fioravanti had crafted his public persona as a worldly gentleman and doctor championing true medicine against all odds and against the corrupt medical establishment. He described himself in heroic terms. He wrote, Many years ago, I began to walk the earth and plow the seas, practicing with different kinds of people, treating men and women suffering with a variety of ailments. And all this I did for no other reason than to rid myself of the ignorance around me. To attain this noble goal, he needed to write in his reader's mother tongue, as he called it. But his unquestionable success at the time was also due to walking the fine line between revealing all his medical secrets to his readers and keeping them intrigued. So, for instance, some recipes were published in cipher, like this one. Alibarim angam ni arepo te aint nerepse ad rafredev ilokarim la odnom. Great, <laughs> great. <laughs> but he would make sure not to make this too hard to read. So if you read each word backwards, you can crack the code. This one reads, Mirabilia magna in opera et esperienza da far veder miracoli al mondo, or a great marvel in works and experience to make miracles be seen in the world. So as always, Fioravanti was an expert in popularizing knowledge, and his flamboyant style only made the books more entertaining. This is one of the reasons why I think, really, that people like him weren't taken seriously by historians for a long time, though that has been changing. Professors of secrets like him paved the way for the scientific revolution, but clearly not everyone was impressed. I say that because the next time we meet Fioravanti, he's in jail. So, after the whole debacle of being accused by physicians in Venice of fraud, Fioravanti went to Milan. Unfortunately, the College of Physicians there was not impressed with his methods either. So, in 1573, they accused him of poisoning his patients and he was sent to jail. Naturally, Fioravanti attributed this once more to envy and, always theatrical, he decided to defend his reputation by challenging the College of Physicians to a medical duo of sorts. This is what I mentioned in the video intro while my, my tea was still nice and warm. So this is what Fioravanti wrote. Let there be consigned to me 20 or 25 people with different ailments and an equal number with the same complaints to the physicians of Milan. If I can't cure my patients faster and better than them, I am willing to be banished forever from this city. I love that. I haven't found anything in terms of the physician's reply, but it seems to me very unlikely that they would agree to the challenge. In any case, a few years later, we find Fioravanti in Spain at the court of King Philip II. He had written to the Viceroy of Naples, reminding him that he had served Philip's father, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, during the African War as a military surgeon. The king then invited Fioravanti to his court, which shouldn't be surprising as the king was very interested in alchemy and had several Italian alchemists in his court. So Fioravanti, as you can see, was well known in Spanish circles. The king himself had four of his books in his private library. However, predictably, even though he was called by some courtiers a saint and a prophet, capable of curing virtually anything, he was once more charged with practicing medicine illegally. Once again, he defended himself by saying the Spanish physicians were just jealous of his successes. His accusers argue that his diplomas from Bologna couldn't possibly be valid because Fioravanti didn't know Latin. But as always, Fioravanti's comeback was that he didn't need to learn Latin to know medicine. He had learned from experience. This was the central message in his works one which translators kept in versions of the text in other languages. So, one of his French translators, for instance, wrote that As the remedies invented by the long practice, judgment and experience of our Fioravanti may seem bizarre, fantastic and of a strange composition, one should think that their results are so marvelous and excellent because they are created by such a naval hand, with solid and expert judgment. The European hunger for new treatments and the eclectic style of Fioravanti's texts turned him into a European phenomenon. He was very successful in translation. His works were published in French, Spanish, German and English, and he had fans and disciples from Portugal to Poland. There are even records of some of his books being exported to the New World. 
they, they were included in a bookseller's shipment to Mexico in 1603. How, how fantastic is that? Having said that, he was never really successful in finding patrons. He wrote to Cosimo de' Medici multiple times, promising everything from a new soap recipe to teaching the Duke how to make an unsinkable ship, as though he was an engineer. And funnily enough, there had been a famous engineer and architect from Bologna, Aristotele Fioravanti, who had lived a century before Leonardo and who had also been very famous. He even designed the Assumption Cathedral and the Kremlin for Ivan III in Russia. I haven't found any evidence of them being related, but it sounds to me like the marketing-savvy doctor was once more trying to capitalize on this sort of name connection. Fioravanti would dedicate his books to noblemen, such as the Duke of Ferrara, in the hope of finding a patron, but that never really happened. So after decades of traveling, Fioravanti eventually returned to Naples. Maybe he sensed that death was approaching, as he wrote in a 1583 book, this will be the end of my labors. Buena noche per siempre. In Spanish, I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, it's possible that, like many alchemists, he had been exposed to toxins such as heavy metals, especially mercury, for long periods while experimenting, and that might have played a part in his death, but we can't really be sure. In any case, after becoming one of the most famous people in the 16th century, Fioravanti died. But the way he was seen by others has greatly changed through time, and that tells us a lot about the history of medicine, too. Fioravanti had openly challenged the medical establishment in many cities and rejected Galenism and the humoral theory. He had created an alternative medical system which relied heavily on reading the body of internal corruptions, especially in the stomach. His theatrical and charismatic persona and flamboyant and eclectic writing style, full of unbelievable stories, had made him a success. He was a master at shaping and reshaping his image, in promoting himself and establishing a brand, as we would call it today. The Balsamo di Fioravanti, Fioravanti's Balsam, was still sold in Italian pharmacies in the beginning of the 20th century. And you can still buy some hair products with his name on it, believe it or not, today. He was the most prolific professor of secrets of his day, and his methods and writings surely had an impact on how, on what we would later call the scientific revolution. He was well regarded during the height of chemical medicine in the 17th and 18th centuries, along with Paracelsus, and his remedies appeared in ph pharmacopoeias well into the 18th century. So just a side note, although there are many similarities between Paracelsus and Fioravanti, it's debatable whether we could say he was a Paracelsian. Fioravanti's English disciples thought so, but I'm not convinced. And by the way, I, I wrote a short article about this rebranding of Fioravanti as a Paracelsian in Britain, which I will link in the description below. So I think he admired Paracelsus, but he created his own system, which was different from Paracelsianism. But while Paracelsus is still very well known, Fioravanti was either completely forgotten or relegated to a minor, slightly embarrassing footnote in the history of medicine. 19th century historians have found it difficult to place Fioravanti in their narratives, but historians are a product of their times, just like everyone else, and have their own reasons for selecting their sources and deciding how to read them. And in the 19th century, the history of medicine was largely being written by physicians and used as an instrument in the growing professionalization of the field. Someone like Fioravanti, who they perceived as a charlatan, did not help legitimize a scientific image of medicine. It's hard to overstate just how much they despised Fioravanti, but I think Salvatore de Renzi, a 19th century physician, sums it up really well. This is what he wrote. Fioravanti was a man of ridiculous vanity, always speaking grandiloquently, lying in the most impudent manner. Every century, medicine seems to be dishonored by one of these audacious charlatans who, until this very day, though devoid of any true knowledge, deceive the vulgar by the art of dazzling and capture the public confidence. I think you could say he wasn't a fan, but that's the thing. History is never a tidy narrative, and the history of medicine isn't a straightforward march to progress. History is full of complexities and contradictions, and Fioravanti is a good example of that. People like him, they sought to understand the world around them through practical experience, and 
questioning old established ways of thinking. It would be hard to imagine a scientific revolution without this open-mindedness and curiosity. And we don't have to choose between people like Fioravanti and Paracelsus, Galen and Alessio Piemontese. They are all part of the story, and if you're interested in the history of everyday life, case studies like this can really tell you a lot from how alchemy, pharmacies, and the printing press were all connected to how medical knowledge was created. This is why I'm so glad that, after a long time as a footnote in history, more historians are studying how people like Fioravanti and the old women who taught him so much, how they played a crucial part in history. Fioravanti longed for his name to be forever remembered. And in truth, he only got a short moment of celebrity. And although I'm not sure about contemporary descriptions of him as the glorious Fioravanti, the man of new miracles, I do believe that he deserves to be remembered. In any case, if you are still with me, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and please consider subscribing to the channel. I also have a Patreon if you would like to join and help me make videos like this. Thank you.